On that Tuesday, when our teacher, Miss Lee, said that we were all to bring something old to school and talk about it, Shane stood up and said that he'd bring something totally amazing. The class laughed and said, oh yeah? And he said, sure, just you wait. So everyone laughed again. Well, everyone except me. That was because Shane was my best mate. He lived at the end of my road with his gran, Big Ella, who painted big splashy paintings in mad colours. She said that Ireland needed sunshiny colours on account of all the grey rain. Shane's clothes were far too small for him because he was a bit of a roly-poly, addicted to jammy donuts, squishy marshmallows and crisps. And yes, he did munch them all at the same time. Whenever anyone sniggered at his wobbly tummy, he'd just say that his chest had slipped a bit, like Obelix in my dad's old Asterix comics that Shane and I shared. Nobody could make Shane angry. If his dark skin was pointed out by some idiot, he'd say he was well done and not a half-baked porridge face. Everything was a laugh, except when anyone made fun of his gran. That's when he'd roar like a bull and flatten them and then sit on them until they screamed, if they were smaller than him, that is. Big Ella was the sort of person who made you feel glad to be with her. She was fun too, and I liked to visit her house because she was always either making brilliant African lime cakes or painting big pictures, which she exhibited at the local art gallery. Nobody knew what the pictures were about, not even if you looked sideways or stood on your head, so she didn't sell many, except maybe to someone who wanted to hide a damp wall or scare away intruders. Sometimes Big Ella and Shane went away for days when she'd get a notion to paint some foggy mountain or windy lake. So when they disappeared after the taking something old to school day, people just said what a nutter she was to take a young lad away from school. Nobody was worried, except me. You see, I knew and I was really scared. This is how it happened. On our way home from school that Tuesday afternoon, I asked Shane what was the amazing thing he was going to bring to history class. You don't have anything at all, I said. I know everything you have in your room, Shane, and you don't have anything interesting. It's all junk. It's not in my room, Milo, he grinned. I'll show you where it is. But if you tell anyone, I'll drown you in sloppy cow dung. I followed him through his grand's wild garden to a bumpy area with piles of stones that were half hidden in the long grass. What are we coming here for? I asked. There's nothing here, only grass and stones. Not just any stones, Milo, said Shane, stooping to pick one up. These were collected by Mr. Lewis. Who's Mr. Lewis? I asked. He lived in our house back in the 18 something or other, explained Shane. He used to collect stones, hundreds of them. He's supposed to have said that there, were, there was something, something special about the stones around here. So Gran says. That's mental, I laughed. Who'd want to collect stones? Shane shrugged. Well, he did. That's what Gran was told when she bought the house. I suppose people didn't have much to do back in those times. What a saddo he was, I hooted. Imagine collecting stones. Shane pointed to the ground. Look, he said. They were all buried here. But these aren't buried, I said, pointing to a pile of stones. They once were, said Shane. Gran has been digging them up. She's going to build a studio here, and she says she's damned if she's going to pay a builder to clear the site when she can do it herself. And me, of course, he added. I get roped in to help. You can help too, Milo. So what's that got to do with the history stuff, I asked, neatly sidestepping the help word. This is just a, a load of grotty stones. Not grotty, retorted Shane, reaching into the pile and pulling up a stone shaped like a, like a half moon. This one is really old. All stones are old, Shane. Even you should know that. It takes millions of years to grow stones. Ah, but this is different, Milo, said Shane. Here, feel it. I took the stone. It was... 
It was like a small broken wheel. On one side there was a pretty clear imprint of a fossilish thing. That's a prehistoric reptile, said Shane. You can even see the scales. But that's not the best thing. Turn the stone over. I did, and I gasped when I saw the pa patterns of circles inside circles, just like the pattern on the huge stone outside the ancient burial place at Newgrange in County Mead. We'd gone there on a school outing once, and Miss Lee had told us that it was even older than the pyramids in Egypt. Shane said it was a pity they didn't have mummies and other dead stuff in there for a better atmosphere. I touched the pattern. That was when I got the first strange feeling. My fingers tingled, and a shiver went around my neck and shoulders. Shane was watching me and smiling. See? You feel it too. I bet you feel all shivery, don't you? Just like me and Gran did. She said that pattern was carved by Celts about 3,000 years ago. Eh! I said, thrusting the stone back into his hand. You're one sickle. Do you know that? Making me hold something that dead people handled. Shane laughed. But they weren't dead when they carved it, you dope, he said. I told you, Shane, all stones are ancient. Except for a few scratchy carvings on it, this looks just like any other. Shane shook his head. My gran, he began. Shane, I laughed. I love your gran, I do. But you do know that she does mad arty stuff and, and talks to dandelions. Come on, mate, wise up. One of you has to stay sane. Hey, retorted Shane, that's Big Ella you're talking about, and she knows everything. Well, I hope that's not your history thing, Shane, I went on. It gives me the creeps. Shane grinned. Of course it's my history thing, he said. Who else will have something as amazing as this? I shivered again, but I didn't know why. Not then. Later on, when we were going home from school, Shane stopped when we got near his house. Big Ella was in the garden, not weeding, because she said that every growing thing had a right to life, which was why the garden was a thick jungle. Shane shoved the stone in a takeaway bag into my hands. You take this, Milo, he said. Gran would have a fit if, if she thought I'd taken the stone. What? I said, backing away. You mean she didn't know you had it? Well, you know, Gran, she got vibes or something. She said she didn't want anyone to know about it because there'd be a fuss, like history nerds coming around the place with those little shovels. You see them using them on the History Channel, nosing about and asking for tea and biscuits and taking stuff away. Can't you pretend there's just school stuff in the bag, I said. Shane shook his head. She has x-ray eyes, my gran. Go on, just for a little while, he pleaded. I'll phone you when the coast is clear, and we'll put it back. What's the big deal? I gave a big, you'll pay for this favour, sigh, and took the bag. I quickly stuffed it into my school bag before my fingers could tingle again. Shane opened the squeaky gate. See you later, he said with a wink. I wasn't happy about being stuck with this crummy stone. Not now that I knew what it was about its past. But with Big Ella waving cheerfully at me, I couldn't very well start an argument. You don't do things like that to your best mate. So I waved back and went down to my own house. I hid the stone under the stairs. No way was I going to have it in my room. Later on, when Mum was catching up on Fair City and Coronation Street, the phone rang in the hall. You get that, Milo, there's a love, said Mum. At first, there was no reply to my hello when I picked up the phone. There was a lot of background crackling and, and then the wheezy sound of someone breathing. Some joker, I thought. And then I heard Shane's voice. Milo, he cried. Ha, it's you, I laughed. I might have known. What are you up to? Milo, the stone. Such drama. OK, OK, I said. No need to overact. Milo! Milo! Shane's voice faded away. I laughed when I put the phone down. I was well used to Shane and his huge dramas. He could just have asked me nicely to bring over the stone. But trust Shane to do his scary voice thing. 
still. I was glad to be getting rid of his old stone. Back in a while, Mum, I called out, taking the bag from under the stairs. I'm just going over to Shane's. Be back before dark, Mum replied. Well, that doesn't give me very long, I thought, as I pulled the front door shut. It was already dusk, and all the neighbours' lights were on. All except one. I was surprised when I reached Shane's house and saw that it was in dusky darkness. Big Ella must have gone for a takeaway. Shane was probably lying in wait to pounce on me. Ha, well, I'd be ready for him. But he didn't pounce. And there was no answer to the special knock Shane and I used whenever we called to one another's houses. By now, his antics were getting right up my nose. I know you're there, I called out through the letterbox. Come on, Shane, open up. I wasn't enjoying this creepiness. Stop acting the dog. <laughs> then I laughed to myself when I realised he was probably waiting for me at the stony place. I headed down to the wild back garden. Ha! I shouted when I saw the figure poking about the stones that Big Ella had dug up. You could have waited for me. You owe me at least a crunchy for hanging out to this thing for you. The figure stopped and turned towards me. But it wasn't Shane. No, no, it definitely wasn't Shane. Even in that dim evening light, I could see the putty-coloured face and staring eyes of someone who didn't belong in this world.